Hello and good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas Eve. I hope you're all doing well. I'm, I'm guessing those of you who are joining in this morning are those planners who have everything completely ready for Christmas morning. And so you're just kind of chilling this morning, laid back, enjoying Christmas already. Or you're maybe going to run out this afternoon. Well, whatever the case may be, glad you're here to join in for Bible study this morning. This is going to be our fourth and final special Advent study. And uh, so glad that you're here. We're going to sing Joy to the World this morning. <clears throat> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. God, we're grateful for this special, special day, this Christmas Eve, where this evening we look forward to your coming, and we remember the stories that have been told for us from one family and one generation to the next about this good news that began the night that you were born. And we ask that as we study your word today and as we reflect on what this all means for us, that your Holy Spirit would inspire us and remind us and encourage us to enter into this Christmas season with our whole selves and our whole lives and to let the good news become a reality in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good to see everybody. And yeah, let's just say hello to some folks here. Let's say good morning, Diane and Pandora. Good morning, Joy and Bob and Carol. Good morning. So we're going to go ahead and uh, continue on with our Advent Bible study. And we have been using uh, Preparing for Christmas by Richard Rohr, this little book of daily meditations for Advent. And we're looking at the Christmas Eve lectionary texts for today. One is coming to us from Isaiah, one is coming to us from Acts, and one is coming to us from Matthew. And we'll look through those and then we'll look at uh, what Richard Rohr has to say um, uh, in these uh, closing remarks. And Mike and Karen, good to see you here this morning too. So let us uh, go ahead and begin with our first text. This is the Old Testament reading, and if you've noticed these last few weeks uh, for Advent, any time that we have an Old Testament text, we've been taking from uh, the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has kind of those staple uh, foundational Messiah prophecy texts, and so that's why we keep seeing Isaiah pop up uh, over and over again. So let's look. Today is Isaiah 62. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken 
and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. All right. Say hello to Arlene for us, Karen, when you see her and tell her Merry Christmas. It'd be nice to see her in person on this special day. Let's uh, jump right into uh, what this text might mean for them and for us. And so, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll point out something that kind of is the, the, the English teacher in me. You know, I, I taught English for a number of years, and part of what you study is literature. And you can kind of pick up on, on this if you look closely. There's a certain type of poetry that is here. And uh, every, every type of poem has its different rules. So, like, if a uh, Japanese haiku, I think, has like 17 syllables, and a sonnet, uh, there's like different rules for different types of sonnets. It has to do with the number of syllables per line and the which words rhyme with which line. So sometimes a line will rhyme with the next one, or it'll alternate from... Uh, the first and the third will rhyme, and the second and the fourth will rhyme. Well, in uh, books like Isaiah, the prophecy is written in a poetic form. And of course, any time that you get uh, words translated from a poem written in a particular language to another, it is uh, the translation job gets even more difficult than if you're just translating a conversation. So if you're translating a conversation, you're just kind of trying to restate from one language to the next the essence of what the person is saying. When you're doing poetry, um, and you're, if you're trying to keep uh, the uh, you know the rhyming patterns and the numbers of syllables exactly the same, and then you're translating it from one language to the next, it just like it doesn't really work. If you've ever heard a song that is from one language to the next, it really starts to, it really starts to change a lot. Now, fortunately for this type of poetry, uh, there, there really, um, it, there could be some rhyming in the original Hebrew. I can't tell you that for sure or not, but what we do have is major concepts repeating each other. So anytime, it, if you just look at the first two lines, for Zion's sake, I will not keep quiet. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. It's, you're, you're basically saying the same thing two different ways. Zion is equivalent to Jerusalem. So there's Mount Zion. There's kind of the center of, of, of the city of Jerusalem. And anytime you say Zion or Jerusalem, you're talking about the capital city, God's chosen city. And uh, I will not keep silent. I will not rest. Those are two kind of equivalent actions that are going to be taken. So if you, if you look through this, you can see there's this repeated concepts over and over and over again. And um, if, if you're looking at the meaning of, for the meaning of something, when you're reading these prophetic uh, texts, um, maybe sometimes the first line makes sense to you and the second line doesn't. If you see it as repeating itself, then maybe you can kind of get to the essence of what's uh, being said there. Um, but we'll, we'll look at kind of the meaning here. And we got a, a few more people here joining. Hello, Paula, and hello, Diane, and hello, Margaret. And Jim, good to see you. Um, so we're, we'll look at, this is, this is really a, a prophetic statement of restoration. And it's, a, it's the restoration of the people of Israel. And you have to remember that they were, in, they were, they were enslaved and they were in Babylon. And then they were able to return home and to rebuild. And so we can't, if you take some time to imagine what this would be like, this is, this is like everybody that you know and everything that you know about your home, if you had a huge major foreign invasion come in, kill people, uh, take their homes, 
and then to take kind of all the people that really are in leadership or that really keep the city going and and give it its identity and and um, and and move it along the path of the life of the city those people are kidnapped and them and their families and they're all taken back to the capital city or to the to the uh, to the country where this these invaders came from and then you're going to have the invaders come in and they're going to establish some kind of a uh, of a foreign government that just kind of runs the show in where you used to live and they're going to make sure that all those resources and anything that's going to be usable and good is going to go back to Babylon back to the the empire and this is something that takes place for one or two generations worth of people so some people they're going to leave their home they're going to go to Babylon and that's where they're going to die because they're you know somewhere in midlife or or at the end of their lives so they never see their home again you have some people that maybe they were very very young and they might even go to the same thing maybe when they come back uh, from captivity they could have been so young that they didn't even remember their homeland and when they got back to it finally when they were old older in life um, you know it's more like they're seeing something for the first time of, of legend and so Israel had the job of just keeping alive their stories and and what their home of uh, of Israel really meant to them and they kept it alive and prophecies are part of this kind of keeping things alive and going and when they're restored back home there's all this poetry written about how God is going to be with you even though this most devastating thing happened I'm sure there were a lot of people that just completely and totally gave up and thought we have just lost our homes we've lost our lives and uh, some people you know they're always looking for reasons a lot of people would say well we deserved it and uh, but this is a, this is a, a story of restoration and basically saying I'm going to take you back home and I'm and and everything is going to be restored and it's going to be so obvious that even your neighbors will will look with awe and with um, you know just surprise that God has done this huge turnaround from a, a homeland of total devastation they're going to come back to almost starting from square one and so we have um, uh, here it starts I will not keep silent I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch so what this means is that God has been there with them all along anything that they have done wrong we've talked about steering the car down the down God's highway they kind of veered off <laughs> the highway and into a ditch and they were there for a long time but God got them back on the road and so this is the the vindication and uh, this is the salvation the, these are the thing these are the terms that are used for getting back on track uh, with God hello to Debbie and um, and Jim is sleeping now okay well good morning Debbie it's good to have you be able to join us from Gainesville our prayers are with you and with Jim and um, you're in our hearts this uh, this story of a vindication of salvation this is something that we absolutely can apply to our own lives because oftentimes we will feel like we've lost our homes we'll feel like we've gotten off track uh, and 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 gotten off the road from God's highway sometimes when you're driving down the highway you have you know maybe you have a little scare and you get off the road and then you get back on no real damage just a scare sometimes we have that sometimes we just ride off the road and, and run into a ditch and sometimes we just get off on an exit and and travel through some weird countryside and and until we realize we need to get back on the highway because that's not going to take us to the right place <laughs> so and of course it's always hard to ask for directions to get back onto the highway or it's hard to go in the wrong way and then admit that you're lost and wrong and turn back around that's a that's an ego blow so metaphorically speaking we can use all of these things to to see how God will get us on track 
God will continue to move us forward no matter how devastating or, or hopeless our situation in our life seems, we can look to these prophetic words and know that this is the character of God. So um, we see that I, he, this, this prophet knows that vindication and salvation is coming and that it's going to be, it's going to shine like the dawn. It's going to be like a burning torch. This is not like something that, you know, you getting your life back is not something that you can keep to yourself. Because once it happens and that you know that God has been a part of it, you just can't keep your mouth shut and you can't help but shine in people realizing that something miraculous and amazing has happened in your life. So this says the nations will see your vindications, the kings will see your glory. So people are going to notice and not just anybody, but like all of your neighbors and even important people can know your story. A lot of times we may want to hide our story of of loss and of uh, of of going off track of you know when things go bad oftentimes we don't want to share it uh, but but when we have a restoration in our life like this we can't help but share it and that's kind of what the what the prophet is seeing here and we we get with this is such a powerfully transformative experience that it says in verse two you'll be called a new name and God will give you that name. And this happens throughout the scriptures. We see when there's a new direction that uh, that God takes you in your life, you get a new name. You get a new identity is basically what it, what it means. The, the transformation is so powerful. You're not the same person you used to be uh, before this transformation took place. Uh, a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This... So this means not only are you restored, but you're given a place of authority in the kingdom of God or, or a place of significance in the kingdom of God. You're not, you will no longer be called forsaken and desolate. So those were terms that they were giving to themselves when they were in this bad place. The name is going to change to my delight is in her and your land is married. That's the name of the land, married. And uh, oftentimes we see in in stories or in poetry, the land and the people are kind of, uh, they're one together. When the land suffers, the people suffer. When the land prospers, the people prosper. So not only are the people uh, the delight of God, but the land is married. And so the, the land and the people are, are married to God. I'm going to look at the footnotes here for a second. Okay, so the, in the footnotes, they're just giving the, the Hebrew names. Um, and I'll just tell you, they're not easy to pronounce. But it means forsaken, desolate, my, li- my delight is in her and married. Because the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. And then it ends with a note of, of this image of the wedding where... Um, just as two people are married together, so the builder will marry you. So now the builder is going to be God, uh, or um, uh, this is going to be the one that restores and brings back to life the the people once they are home and rebuilding. And the bridegroom rejoices over the bride; your God will rejoice over you. So it's a this is a um, a message of salvation, of vindication, of transformation. And this is what the good news and this is what Christmas is all about. This is this is about God coming into our lives, uh, even in situations that seem most dire, and us seeing God work in our lives in a way that we become new and we become restored and, we, and our identity can even change uh, just like these names are changed here. So that's Isaiah 62, 1 through 5. That's our first text. And let's go ahead and look at our second text. This is going to be taken from the book of Acts. And it is chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 16 and 17. And verses 22 through 25. All right. And this is, uh, of course, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So Acts is just kind of the short abbreviated name for the book. 
It's the acts of the, of the early disciples after Jesus has uh, resurrected and the Holy Spirit is poured out on the early uh, disciples and the early church. So it's the acts of the Holy Spirit or the acts of the Holy Spirit um, through the disciples into this new church. It's kind of the history of the new church. It's, it's a, more of a history book than really any of the other books of the, of the New Testament. And so we're, when we come in here, this is going to be Paul. Uh, and Paul is giving a, uh, a sermon or a, he's, he's speaking here. And uh, we see in the book of Acts kind of a transformation from Peter being the main guy to Paul being more of the main guy. So once we get to chapter 13, we start to hear from Paul. So uh, Acts 13, starting in 16, and then moving on, uh, skipping from 17 on to 22 through 25. So Paul stood up. And with a great gesture began to speak, You Israelites and others who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And we go to verse 22. When he had removed him, he made David their king. In his testimony about him, he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart who will carry out all my wishes. Of this man's prosperity, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Out of this man's posterity, I think I said prosperity. Out of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he's promised. Before his coming, John had already proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his work, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but, the one, is com but one is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of the sandals on his feet. All right, so this is a, a little... Kind of historical synopsis here. So Paul is speaking to the people of Israel. He's speaking even to people who will fear God. So this is uh, this is an interesting phrase here because, uh, as we know, the the beginnings of the good news of the gospel with Jesus are preached to mostly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah, that's what when they ask Jesus. Who's, who's your audience or who are you sent to? He said, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's where he spent his time. That's where his mission was accomplished. And it's out of that that it began to spread. But he's called first to Israel. And then as it goes into the early church, they continue to spread this gospel news throughout the people of Israel. And then we see that there are people who are not Israelites, the Gentiles. Anybody that's not an Israelite is a Gentile. Uh, anyone who's considered to be a God-fearer or someone who has faith in God is considered to be somebody who can experience and enter into the salvation and the good news of God. So even here with Paul, you can see he's speaking first to the Israelites and then others who fear God. This is, this is who his message is to. He speaks first to Israel and he says, remember um, uh, that, that our ancestors were chosen and God even made them a great nation when they were enslaved in Egypt. This is, this is kind of when the people of Israel, not just the family uh, and patriarchs of Israel, but when the people of Israel, it really starts in the land of Egypt and with the Exodus. And so this is where God really starts to move with them as a people. And here's the phrase, with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. So it's another story, just like the one from Babylon. It's another story of God taking a people out of captivity and moving them into a land of promise and, and restoration. So when Israel goes through uh, other problems in their history, like they did with Babylon, they looked back to kind of the origins of 
of who they were as a people many generations ago and said, God did it back then, God can do it again. And that's what, that's what we use uh, as, as Christians and people of faith as we say, God will do the same thing God has been doing. And then he kind of goes in verse 22, he goes on closer to the story of Jesus and he makes mention that it's through King David that Jesus comes to this place. So there's this covenant promise that God makes with the people of Israel. And when it comes to David, uh, David and David's kingdom becomes the, the, the gold standard of where God wants uh, Israel to be, because this is the place in the history of Israel, according to their, uh, you know, historical remembrance. If we were trying to get to any good place, then uh, we need to get to the place where David was. So, under David, we have the united tribes all under one king. This was started with Saul, the first king of Israel, and then it kind of ex is expanded with King David. And King David is, he's right with God. He's, he, he's been there, uh, a man after God's own heart, from the beginning of his life all the way, all the way through. Now he does, you know, just like any of the other characters of the Bible, they go through their places where they veer off the road and, and get back on. But um, the, the uh, covenant that God makes with David is said to be an eternal covenant. And it says there will always be some kind of a family member from David on the throne. So when they look at the Messiah, the chosen one, oftentimes the Messiah is considered to be a, a, a priest or king, uh, someone who's anointed, they're looking for this king, this Messiah king, to come again at some point in time and to restore uh, the, the people to the place where it was under David. So this is, again, the gold standard of king and people and land, and it's about prosperity, and it's about keeping your enemies at bay. It's about worshiping God in the temple. It's about everything that, that it's supposed to be. So, you know, we're, we're familiar with the phrase, make America great again. That is a phrase that says there was a point in time that was the gold standard, the good old days. This is what people would look to when they see King David on the throne is those are the good old days we need to always try to get back to that. And so that's what, when when the Messiah is supposed to come, that's what the Messiah does. The Messiah gets you back to the good old days, back to the place that was the absolute best place that you could be in your relationship with God and in relationship with the people and with the earth. And so um, this is a... Uh, this is, uh, shows where Jesus ties into that. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to bring about everything that David represented. And, and this is, of course, why many of the people of Israel, when they didn't see a literal crown of gold on his head and a literal, you know, getting the enemies of, of Rome to leave the city and establishing a kingdom, when they didn't see that, they were thinking kind of with their with their physical minds, a physical reality of something going back to what David was. And when Jesus comes, he's like, I'm, I'm going to do that. But on a kind of on a deeper level and a more real sense, I'm going to do more, much more than what King David was all about. So we have Jesus in this line of David, and then we have the announcement that this Messiah, this King, uh, is coming, and that was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist knew exactly uh, what his mission was, and it was to usher in uh, the this this kingdom, or to to usher in the King who would usher in the kingdom, 
and to really fulfill the prophecy that God had had uh, put out there for many, many generations. They're all waiting for the Messiah. So that's our second text. And, and here's our third and last text taken from the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look in chapter 1 of Matthew in verses 18 through 25. So this is the birth of Jesus. There's a few... Um, uh, we have... Uh, Ma let's see, we have Matthew and Matthew and Luke are kind of the, our primary sources for these um, Christmas stories of Jesus' birth. Uh, the, the Gospel of, of uh, Mark really starts not at the birth of Jesus, but starts with the ministry of Jesus. It goes straight into, you know, Jesus is a, a grown man and he's starting in his ministry. And Mark is the is considered by most to be the book that was the closest in time to the ministry of Jesus. And then later, when we have Matthew and Luke, we start to get these stories that don't just start with the ministry of Jesus, but start with the birth of Jesus. So they, when they re started to recognize how important Jesus was, they're, they're saying we, we need to start these Gospels, not just with his ministry, but with his birth. So this is Matthew's text here. We'll read this, and then later tonight at our Christmas Eve service, we'll look at the Luke text, which is probably the most well-known text that's read on Christmas Eve. And then the book of John is really more of a, uh, goes even further back, not just to the birth of Jesus, but to the beginning of all time and space, with Christ being... Uh, the the one that begins it all. So John almost goes back to rewriting the whole scriptures and starting, you know, Genesis starts with in the beginning God created and and then in uh, in John it's in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. So it's kind of rewriting Genesis almost to start with the Word to start with Christ and to show that He's at the beginning, not just at the beginning of when He was born. Uh, but from the beginning of time, so that's kind of the development that we see, and and it kind of it kind of shows how the people start to realize how important Jesus was, and how significant he is in the in the plans of God. Going from Mark that starts with the ministry and teachings of Jesus, Matthew and Luke that start with the birth of Jesus, and John that starts with the beginning of Christ, uh, from the beginning of time. So. Back to Matthew. <laughs> Matthew 1, uh, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly, but just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as an angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and named him Jesus. So this is the Gospel of Matthew of uh, chapter 118 through 25. All right, so let's unpack this, our Christmas story. So we have the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. So we, again, we've been talking about the Messiah from the time of King David on through the captivity of Babylon and its restoration. All throughout time, people are looking to the Messiah is the one that comes and gets Everybody on track establishes a place of peace and prosperity. 
So uh, the Apostle Paul is sharing with the people, both Israelites and the people who fear God, this is the story of the birth of this person who is the Messiah. And uh, Messiah and Christ, same word. Uh, one, is, one is Hebrew, one is Greek. But we're saying Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the chosen one. And this is how he's born. So here are some important things, according to Paul, that we need to keep in mind. This, again, is uh, taken from, uh, from Matthew. I'm sorry, I, I started saying Paul. This is not Paul. That was, that was back in Acts. This is, this is, the, um, <laughs> this is the, the gospel of Matthew. So Paul comes later on. Uh, so when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph before they lived together, she's found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So this, of, this of course, the Virgin Mary, uh, this is a, you know, a central part of the story that we're taught from generation to generation as Christians about the birth of Jesus. This is something important because what we're saying is if uh, this, this gets into uh, us trying to figure out how important Jesus is. And as Christians, we come to the place where we say we believe Jesus is divine. And the, the early church took centuries and centuries, four or five centuries before they kind of got to be on the same page about how can a person be God. And this is complete and total heresy and anathema for the Jewish people, for the, the Muslim people later on in history, people that are strict monotheists saying there's only one God and there's a separation between God and God's creation and God is not part of his own creation. God is outside of his own creation. How in the world then does God become a person? And so this is where things like the virgin birth, uh, are they're, they're fit into the story to show that this person is not like everybody else. Uh, every, nobody is born of a virgin because if you're born, that means your mother's not a virgin anymore, all right? And we all kind of understand what that means. This, this is um, a way of showing how special and how significant uh, and how miraculous this person's life is, is that they could come into existence with, without having to go through the normal means of getting a person to be born. <laughs> so this is, this is taken... You know, the, as, as the Gospel of Matthew is written, it goes back to uh, this text. And uh, there's not, a, there's not a, um, a footnote here, but this is one of the prophetic texts that a virgin, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and, and name him Emmanuel. So uh, they're showing that not only is he, is he born in a special way, but there's been a prophecy that we, he would come to exist. And that prophecy again shows that Jesus is important. And uh, it also goes to show that Joseph was a supportive uh, father, a supportive figure in this, uh, in this coming of the Messiah. So even though uh, they weren't married yet, and even though they hadn't been together yet, uh, so that they could have had children, Joseph, when he's told by uh, the Lord in a dream, he goes ahead and he marries Mary and becomes the father of Jesus because he understands the magnitude and the specialness of this person. And so, you know, when we're, when we're going through the story and we're living in 2020 and we speak much more openly today than probably previous generations did about, you know, uh, marital relations and and so on. This reading about virgins and about a child out of wedlock and all of that it gives, it 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 doesn't it doesn't feel great. It's kind of this, uh, you know, it's not this neat and tidy story yet. It requires. In order for this, the, the, the real miracle and special part of Jesus coming into this world to exist, it requires 
these messy things to happen, which is kind of kind of neat and interesting that God doesn't do things in this neat and clean way. The way that God gets stuff done and gets more done than we could ask for or imagine is through messy means. And when we kind of when we when we catch on to that and we start to look for the way that God operates in our lives, if we see that God is always accomplishing his purposes, but it can get messy along the way and will require us to have faith along the way. You can't get there just through logical or loyal or, you know, you you can't get to that place where you're really fully understanding and participating in what God is doing in your life without faith. You need faith. Joseph had to have faith. Mary had to have faith in order for them to really fully participate in this because it didn't make sense. Why would God do something and and God is doing something that's like a not only is it against the way that it's normally done, it's kind of it could be scandalous or immoral if it's viewed from the wrong way. So uh, there are people of faith and trust in God that God is doing something. And this child that is born, his name is Emmanuel, which is God with us. He tells Joseph to name your child Jesus. Jesus is the same name as Joshua, Yeshua, which both names mean, you know, I think Jesus is the is like the Aramaic or Greek uh, name for Yeshua. And both of these mean salvation. So Joshua is given the name Joshua when he brings the children of Israel into the promised land because his name means the salvation of God it gets complete in their life. So this is the same name that Jesus has. He is Yeshua. He is Joshua. He is, you know, in, in the language the, of the New Testament, he's Jesus. And it means salvation. So that's why Jesus is named salvation. Jesus' name is salvation. Salvation, the Anointed One, Jesus the Christ. Uh, and then, of course, there are other names that are given. These are kind of like pet names, or not pet names, but these are these are affectionate names, let's say, that are given to God or given to the people of God. So we call him Emmanuel. We call him God with us. So Salvation, the Anointed One, God is with us. That's the name of Jesus Christ. And so this is... Um, uh, the story of Christmas Eve, and this is the story that kind of sets up the celebration of Christmas. So let's go ahead and look at a few paragraphs here from Richard Rohr. Uh, and I'm, uh, I have been reading the last uh, three times from the Sunday text, and I decided to choose the Christmas Eve text uh, for our study today. So... Um, I am going to read, uh, first of all, this is 2 Samuel 7 and some of its verses. This is kind of the setup for Richard Rohr's uh, uh, statements here. And 2 Samuel says, Go and tell my servant David, are you, the one, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I took you from the pasture. I have been with you wherever you went. I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name. I will appoint a place for my people Israel. The Lord declares that you, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So as we were saying before, this is one of those texts that looks to the King David, the kingdom of David, as uh, the place where God says, this is who I want on my throne, and I want your descendants on the throne, and I want this kingdom to be my kingdom forever and ever. This is the kind of the eternal covenant of David. And for us as Christians, we see Jesus as coming in as the Messiah, not only is he the chosen and the anointed one, but he's of the line of David. And if we look at our Matthew text, we see 
uh, in verse 20, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So he's calling Joseph the son of David. And so uh, here's, here's one of the ways that we see Jesus fitting into that, um, into that covenant of God. So here's, here's kind of a, some of the terms from, or some of the statements from Richard Rohr this morning. Probably not many people read meditations on Christmas Eve morning. So I congratulate you for taking time to do so when I know there must be so many exciting and anticipatory things to do today. All is in readiness. Maybe, and hopefully we can all say that, all is in readiness. There's probably no day of the year which has so much expectation as December 24. It is really more Christmas than Christmas Day itself because it holds the full energy of Advent. Time has come to its fullness, like it says in Luke 2, 6. Hardly anybody comes to church this morning. It is about tonight for some wonderful reason. This is unfortunate, however, because the first reading of today's morning is especially poignant and actually one of my favorites, but hardly anyone hears it today. The reading is a wonderful dialogue between the prophet Nathan and King David, part of which we read above. This changing of sides is the great turnaround, which henceforth becomes the central biblical theme of grace, election, and divine initiative. We set out like David, thinking we have to do something to prove ourselves to God. Build God a house is the metaphor. And as always, God turns it around and says, No, David, let me build you a house. It's time to let that story soak into our unconscious. It will prepare us for the day ahead much more than anything I could say. Reflect on this. Are you still trying to build God a house? Or can you first let God build one for you? So... Good Christmas thoughts uh, for us this morning. Uh, I hope that you are excited, as I am, for what today and tonight have in store. I hope that this Christmas season is very meaningful to you. It can help you to reflect on the way that God has brought salvation and good news into your own life. And I hope that you enjoy your time with friends and with family. As always, be safe. And, um, and, and enjoy uh, your, your love and being together with people that you love. And we look forward to uh, a new year. And we look forward to what God has in store for us then. But today we celebrate. Today we celebrate the birth of Jesus. All right, so let's sing together our sending song on Christmas Eve. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought and word bring glory to your name. Send us out in your Spirit, Lord, we pray. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought and word bring glory to your name. Send us out in your Spirit, Lord, we pray. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining in this morning. And uh, look forward to seeing some of you tonight. And uh, we will not have a live Bible study on uh, next Thursday. Uh, on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, we won't have. I may, I may put in a, a rerun, uh, but I will see you again uh, after that, the first Thursday of the new year and look forward to what that uh, has in store for us. So have a great day and take care. Bye-bye.